there's a lot of hype associated with uh, psychedelics, a lot of history that's reflected by this old life uh, cover, but we see this in a lot of other uh, public, uh, uh, if you will, uh, lay magazines, but also an increasing number of more science-focused magazines and publications looking at uh, high psychedelics or hallucinogens. And we see this even more so now with the uh, uh, publication this year of the first volumes of psychedelic medicine that is attempting to really push forward the, the peer-reviewed science associated with psychedelics and psychedelic medicine. This is very different than a lot of the lay uh, press that is promoting it for well-being and such. And I, I want to kind of tease apart the differences at some points during this presentation. But I wanted to emphasize that there's a lot of great science going on in the field of psychedelics. As I mentioned, there's also a lot of um, lay interest, and this was uh, supercharged, if you will, by Michael Pollan's book that came out a few years ago, How to Change Your Mind, that was more recently turned into a, uh, I think it was a Netflix documentary series. Actually, a lot of really good uh, material in there, a lot of interesting anecdotes and uh, history and interviews with leaders in the field. We also saw some perhaps hyperbolic uh, material coming out of some uh, uh, lay publications and lay movies, such as the series Nine Perfect Strangers, where psilocybin at this uh, wellness retreat supposedly led uh, individuals to be able to talk to dead loved ones and, and other such things. So a, a lot of... Um, misconceptions, I think, going on in the field. There are increasing numbers of academic centers that are coming into this space. Here's uh, an example of uh, University of California, San Francisco and their magazine. We also see Stanford very much involved in this research, MIT as well. And of course, we have our own center here uh, that is about three years old now. Uh, it is, um, I think, one of the more interesting ones because we have such a transdisciplinary cross-campus focus I'll talk a little bit more about later. But psilocybin is not new. Ayahuasca is not new. We have uh, evidence from sculptures you see here and paintings that uh, psychedelic mushrooms have been incorporated into uh, traditional sacram uh, sacramental ceremonial purposes uh, for, for centuries, if not millennia. And so we have a substantial background in terms of the uh, acceptance of this in traditional cultures. There are many psychoactive drugs that are currently being looked at. These are some of the more common ones, but I'll point out that there are a lot of new chemical compounds that are being uh, developed, synthesized, and in part that's due to uh, an attempt to try to develop some intellectual property on these more compounds. These compounds that I show here are developed from natural products, and they are difficult to patent, if you will. And so it's difficult to protect the, the intellectual property and protect potential profits if you're using a, a natural substance such as those listed here. Uh, LSD is obtained from uh, fungus on various grains. Psilocybin, as you know, comes from uh, various mushrooms. 5-methoxy-DMT is related to dimethyltryptamine, but it comes from the Sonoran Desert Toad. And because of individuals trying to harvest these and, and extract or ex, uh, expel the, uh, the, the toxin from their skin glands, the Sonoran Desert Toad is actually threatened. We have dimethyltryptamine uh, as part of the ayahuasca mixture that we see here, uh, widely used in many uh, ceremonies in the uh, the Andes, northern South uh, South America, and then mescaline from the peyote, uh, which is part of a sacramental uh, traditional use in various Native American cultures. We have some others down here as well that uh, I'm not going to spend really any time on. I really want to focus on psilocybin. I also wanted to point out that there is another way to kind of look at this, and this is a development wheel from Josh Hardman's fantastic uh, online resource for things psychedelic, psychedelicalpha.com. And you can see from this pie chart that we've got uh, on the outer tan ring, compounds that are in discovery, preclinical uh, animal work, for example. And then the light blue going inward is the phase one where we're looking at safety and any signals of, of efficacy. Phase two, where we're looking more at efficacy signals. Phase three, where we're comparing compounds to the um, the standard therapy, standard of care, for, for example. 
And then blue, the dark blue in the center, the bullseye, are drugs that are currently approved by the FDA. Right now, the only one that is approved is ketamine, but you can see that there are some coming in, but the ones that are most um, developed are psilocybin, I would argue, and that's also a function of the history that we had, some uh, traditional use, but also some use in the 1960s, early 1970s, before they were made uh, illegal, where there was a lot of work done on these compounds. So why are we using psilocybin? I've already mentioned that there's an extensive uh, historical use. We have some evidence of dramatic benefit already from some preliminary studies, well tolerated in screened subjects. I'll talk a bit more about that uh, screening and preparation in a second. Well, in a few minutes. And then also that it's got a shorter duration of action than LSD, which might be something that people might think, well, we, we know that LSD has been used in the past as well, but actually uh, the, the LSD effects last so much longer than psilocybin that instead of being an outpatient procedure, outpatient treatment today with psilocybin, LSD goes into the evening hours and would probably require an overnight stay. And then we have the other extreme with compounds like 5-MeO-DMT, again, from the Sonoran Desert toad, that has a very rapid onset and a very rapid offset. And one of the reasons why people are looking at compounds like this is that perhaps we can treat more people per day, get them in, get them out. But we don't know that that's going to be the better way to treat people, um, The more that it's going to be as effective as a more sustained uh, experience. Talk a little bit more about that. So the psychedelic reboot or the psychedelic renaissance arguably came about at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, Roland Griffiths in the early 2000s started looking at psilocybin primarily, but also some of the other psychedelic compounds that I mentioned. And uh, he is unfortunately uh, uh, suffering from some uh, colon cancer. So I'm afraid he's not going to be with us terribly much longer, but clearly uh, a giant in the field and a really good man. Bill Richards, the picture below, graduate student in the heyday in the late 60s with Walter Pankey and others, and actually is still active at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore and has carried the knowledge and some of the experiences, the methods uh, to not only Johns Hopkins, but also to programs such as ours. So a great deal of thanks goes to both of these gentlemen. The Johns Hopkins experience, again, reported in around 2008, looking at uh, individuals that received a dose of psilocybin. This is a study where they received psilocybin or they received uh, a, the stimulant Ritalin, a methylphenidate. And you can see that the percentage of individuals that felt that this was one of the top five personally meaningful experiences of their lifetime was about 60%. And that persisted over 14 months. And interestingly also, that was the case for spiritually significant experiences of their lifetime. So they, this was basically the saying that, that this was as important as a birth of a child or a marriage or a death of a parent, something like that. So the people in this uh, study, granted, they were uh, fairly small groups, around 30 or so, uh, had some dramatic effects. If you look at then a follow-up study where they looked at individuals with uh, end-of-life cancer, um, the, the amount of time that they had varied somewhat. These individuals got a low dose of psilocybin, not the Ritalin as before, but a low dose of psilocybin that they felt was going to be uh, sub-perceptible or minimally perceptible, and compared that to a higher dose, a dose similar to what we're currently using now. And we have two plots here, one on the left looking at depression and remission to normal range, and on the right side, anxiety, again, remission to normal range. And on the y-axis, we've got the percentage of individuals who basically went into remission of their depression. You can see, of course, that the high-dose uh, psilocybin at five weeks was uh, more effective than the low-dose in causing people to have a remission of their depression or, on the right, their anxiety. But what's really interesting about this is that at six months, six months later, that the percentage of individuals who had had this remission actually improved, but didn't go down. So this is exciting. And again, I'll emphasize that this is with one dose. Okay. One of the things that we're grappling with here over on the right is the demographic distribution of individuals in these studies. And this is a problem across the board at the academic sites, even at our own where the individuals that have been brought into these studies and to have demonstrated such dramatic effects are primarily white, college educated, fairly well-to-do, and we do not have a good representation of black, Asian Americans, 
um, indigenous peoples. And so that is one of the things that we struggle with. And that's, uh, I'll mention a little bit, uh, some of the reasons why we think that might be the case, some of the challenges that we're facing, trying to increase the number of individuals that uh, are participating in these studies so we can have a better sense of not only if it works, but how we can make it work better for peoples of different cultures. There's another study that came out from Robin Har Carhart Harris, who used to be at London College, now at uh, UC Berkeley. And he did a study in 50 individuals. Um, and these were individuals with major depressive disorder. And it was a double-blinded, double-dummy study. So subjects received either um, two doses of 25 milligrams of oral psilocybin, about a month apart, three weeks apart. Or in the other arm, they received citalopram, a uh, common uh, antidepressant that's taken daily. And they received several weeks of it at 10 milligrams uh, per day and then went up to 20 milligrams per day. And they also received, as part of this double dummy or double uh, masked um, sort of trial, a capsule that contained one milligram of psilocybin. Again, but they didn't think it was going to be particularly active as a psychedelic. And this way they were able to tell the patients or the participants rather, well, I guess they were patients, they had depression, um, that they had, um, that they, everybody was going to get psilocybin. So this expectation that uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't get psilocybin was removed. Everybody got psilocybin. And this is what the results were from their study. Now, looking at one um, tool for looking at depression uh, at the upper, upper panel, you can see that there was a rather rapid drop in the uh, change in the depression score for both arms. As time went by, these differences kind of minimized. And there was, unfortunately, the problem that in, in this New England Journal article, they had made their primary uh, endpoint, this uh, quid score. But when you look at the, um, the other, other instrument for looking at depression, lower panel, you can see that there was a substantial difference between the, the psilocybin and the escitalopram in individuals, and that after the second uh, dosing day, that we had a continuing increase in improvement, and that that persisted for uh, about, about a month and a half. So this was, a, again, an encouraging study. This is one of the few that we have that actually compares the psilocybin to a common uh, antidepressant, and it was, suggests that there is a signal there. Now, the Compass Pathways company that is developing uh, one of the psilocybin products did a study in which they looked at psilocybin given at a single uh, one milligram dose, 10 milligram dose, or 25 milligram dose. And you can see that with the gray, bar, uh, gray line on top being the one milligram, the green being the 10, and the 25 milligram dose, the blue line at the bottom. We see that there is a very dramatic, quick drop in the depression score in these patients with treatment-resistant depression, suggesting that there is some placebo effect, even with the one milligram dose. As time went by, the significant difference uh, went away, and at uh, 12 weeks, the confidence interval in included one, uh, so that they couldn't say that at 12 weeks, the uh, 25 milligram dose was more effective. I'll point out here that one of the things that's uh, interesting about this whole area of dosing psilocybin for depression is that people are trying basically one dose for the most part. This company and USONA looking at one dose, and we don't know what would happen if we dosed it more consistently every month or if we gave boosters if the depression started coming back. That's probably something that we're going to have to wait until the drug is approved by the FDA in several years before others have the opportunity to try optimizing the therapy. But still, we see a, a very rapid drop. Now, because of the slides that I've shown you in terms of this uh, dramatic effect, rapid effect of psilocybin in the treatment of depression that's been granted breakthrough drug status for both uh, the Compass Pathway organization that I just mentioned and also the USONA Institute down in Fitchburg. Now, the difference there is that the USONA Institute is looking at major depressive disorder, and they hope to start their phase three st registration study uh, later this year. Compass Pathways, uh, I just showed you their uh, results is looking at a slightly different, more difficult group, treatment-resistant depression. Their phase three registration study has already started. The closest uh, study sites that I'm aware of for that Compass Pathways study are in Ohio at Cincinnati and Columbus. The studies are expected to be done 
in about 2025. And if you give a, a year or so for the FDA to look at the data and give the approval, and then for um, basically ramping up the, avail the availability of the drug, we can anticipate, if one is an optimist, that the FDA will be approving one or both of these compounds or these products, same drug, but different products, uh, in about three to four years. So I, within five years, I would argue that we're going to have psilocybin available for the treatment of depression. Now, one of the things that we're particularly interested in here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is the use of psilocybin for substance use disorders. And part of this is based on some uh, work that again came out of Johns Hopkins, so study by Matt Johnson that looked at 15 uh, adults with an average of six failed attempts to stop smoking. And in addition to some traditional methods of cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness, they also were scheduled to receive three doses of psilocybin about a month apart. And uh, there was, the results were really quite remarkable. If you look at the cigarettes per day in this study that was uh, had some long-term follow-up as well, you can see that the number of cigarettes with each individual represented by a dot here, each in the uh, it's 10 weeks, the number of individuals that were taking any cigarettes was only two out of that group of 15. Over time, a few more had been taking a few cigarettes, but you can see that in terms of a long-term uh, change in behavior, that, is, that this um, treatment with two to three doses of psilocybin had a dramatic effect. I'll point out again that the demographics were imbalanced. And this is, again, something that we're trying to uh, work on. Uh, one of the re remarkable things I'll also point out about this study is that uh, the quit day was on the first dose of the psilocybin, of course, I know the first dose of psilocybin, and these individuals did not get nicotine gum or patches. So they didn't have that support. Now, how does that compare with other therapies? Well, on the left, we have another representation of the Hopkins study, Matt Johnson study, and in this case, we're looking at urinary codetine, which is a metabolite of nicotine to give us a sense of how much, uh, how much nicotine they're taking, whether it be vapes or cigarettes or whatever. And you can see that um, the majority of these individuals at six months had no codetine, no evidence of any use of nicotine in their uh, urine, therefore their blood. So these people were completely abstinent. 80% of these 15 were abstinent at six months. Now, if you look at a study that looked at nicotine lozenges for smoking to cessation, this is patients that had a fairly high dependency uh, report by Schiffman. You can see that at that same six-month mark, 26% of the individuals that were in the study were completely abstinent. So we've got a comparison here of 80% versus 26%. However, I will point out, again, that the Sopkins study had 15 subjects in it and that the uh, study by Schiffman had over 900. And so these studies are small that are so encouraging. They're, they're still small. And uh, recently, I think it was last year, late last year, the um, NIH put a, granted a grant to Hopkins, New York University, and the University of Alabama to look at psilocybin in a, um, in a more um, traditional comparative uh, study, looking at it for the treatment of tobacco cessation or tobacco uh, substance use. And just so we're excited to see how that study evolves. But finally, the NIH is funding studies like this to um, allow us to get the numbers that will have give us more confidence about whether or not uh, the psilocybin really is doing, uh, having such remarkable results as it might seem at first. There's also some evidence that alcohol uh, use is decreased with the uh, dosing of psilocybin. This is a study by Michael Volkenschutz at New York University. They received two doses, and you can see again that uh, the, the alcohol use dropped quickly with um, the first dose of psilocybin, and then um, also a little bit more after the second. The 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 having drinking days dropped within in the four, one to four week period after the first dose of, of psilocybin and then continue to drop after the second month as well. There are two doses here. The control group here was very large doses of diphenhydramine or, or Benadryl. And so one would expect that there'd be some drowsiness, some sleepiness, possibly some uh, 
disoriented feelings, but you can see that there was a significant difference, but also a, a placebo effect here with the gray lines on top still showing a fairly rapid drop after the first dose. So that's one of the things that we're grappling with is this heavy placebo effect, whether it be for depression or various uh, substance use disorders. And then there are all sorts of other things that people are looking at or psychedelics, whether it be psilocybin or others. These include eating disorders, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, headaches. Actually, Yale has some really good data for cluster headaches and even migraines. PTSD is on the list. Anxiety at the end of life is also being looked at. And so what we're seeing here is basically uh, a process of for neurologic disorders, even psych some psychiatric disorders, we're going to throw some spaghetti at the wall and see if it sticks. There are uh, many different um, applications of the psychedelics that are being explored. I think one of the primary things that's holding it up is the lack of uh, funding to do these studies. And I think one of the other reasons that we're looking at it is not the frustration with effective therapies for a lot of them. But again, also individuals looking for, and groups looking for a way to um, monetize some of these applications. So how do these psychedelics work? What is the mechanism by which we're seeing such dramatic results? Um, we know that these psilocybin-like uh, drugs, these classic psychedelics, are acting primarily as agonists or effectors on the serotonin HT2A receptor. We also have some evidence that they act on HT1A receptors and one uh, B's as well. Uh, the, the differences that we see from one psychedelic to a, another, psilocybin versus DMT, is likely due to several things, including the affinity of the compound for the 2A versus the 1, the one series receptors, uh, how they tickle each receptor in a slightly different fashion, and also the duration of how long the, um, the, con the psychedelic is resting in that receptor. And that's going to be a function of its metabolism rate and the rate of absorption. So we have um, the potential that one psychedelic might have a different effect for depression or substance use disorders. Really, we uh, don't have a lot of comparative studies at this point to really know which is, is better than psilocybin, if any. So we can anticipate, again, that some of those studies will be done and should be done if uh, funding is available. Now. Granted, we're going to assume that we've got some pharmacologic action of the psilocybin resting in various receptors, different uh, entourage of various receptors. So what else is happening? And there are those that would say that we're unlocking a change in consciousness, that we're developing opportunities to look at the mystical side of spirituality. And then others that are arguing that this is a much more mundane uh, pharmacologic effect. Well, there's some data that suggests that the intensity of that mystical effect, that not necessarily the psychedelic component, the hallucinogens, but the mystical effect is uh, uh, important. And we see that with questionnaires such as the mystical experience questionnaire. This comes from uh, one of the Johns Hopkins group studies looking at the mysticism score, score after psilocybin and the spiritual significance. And you can see that there is some correlation there with the uh, intensity of that mystical experience. But we also have various other instruments that have been proposed trying to identify what um, kind of experience someone has and to see if in fact that uh, the intensity of that experience or some aspects of that experience are important in terms of bringing that into the behavioral change or the, uh, the mental health change that we're seeking to achieve. And that will be uh, one of the things that we're looking at when I get to the recap study in, in a few minutes that we're doing here. So there are other models that have been suggested as a potential reason why psychedelics are working. And one that just came out from the Hopkins group as well was this uh, thought that learned helplessness is an example of how um, depression might be manifested or substance use disorder or inability to um, to resolve a substance use disorder, that psychedelics may be able to, uh, as they, they seem to with animal models, overcome learned helplessness and futility. And so this is one of the, the models that was just recently uh, suggested in the Psychedelic Medicine Journal, and I think has a, a, a really good um, 
structure or a good history, if you will, as a as a model of animal behavior as well as human behavior. So this will be interesting to look at uh, this issue of learned helplessness. Another um, way of looking at it is the sense of entropy that's been promoted by Robin Carhart Harris now at UC uh, Berkeley. And here the sense is that the psychedelics provide a, a sense of forced entropy that that it decreases the organization of the brain, if you will, and the, the thoughts of the brain um, so that we can recast the way we're thinking or rethink our thinking. So here's an example of uh, square ice cubes being melted. Uh, ba basically, the entropy is increased. We've, we've um, decreased the organization of these ice cubes, but then it can be recast into a round ice cube. Another way of thinking it of about of it uh, may be like a rutted road where we're in uh, a rut uh, and it's difficult to drive out of that rut. The deeper um, it is, the more difficult it is to get out. And so it's thought that perhaps the psychedelics may be like this bulldozer that can be pushed down this rutted road so that now you're more free to move about and to think about uh, how what other directions you might be taking. Mass by the example of this nice smooth road. I'm hoping that University Avenue will soon look like this right now. Um, I'm a bit frustrated. <laughs> so here's an example of uh, some fMRI data that uh, has come out of Robin Carhart Harris's group. And on the left, you see some ruts, if you will. the The brain is, if you will, communicating with just some limited other areas and <clears throat> And these are the ruts that the brain is in. And under psilocybin, um, interestingly, they were able to do the uh, to test these individuals with an fMRI uh, device while they were under the influence. And you can see that now the brain is talking to all sorts of other parts of the brain. And this may be where, for example, in the psychedelic side of things, we might uh, smell sounds or we might see um, sounds are this this is the this transformation of our sensorium is um, part of what we think might be happening as individuals undergo a psychedelic experience. Now it doesn't stay this um, this chaotic, if you will, but it does allow the brain to start tapping into other parts of its thought process that perhaps it hasn't allowed itself to do in, in the past. And this is one of the thoughts where people can all of a sudden say, you know, I, I am able to be defined by something other than my substance use disorder, or I can, I can see myself being happy and moving past my, uh, my futility, my sense of futility and my depression. And so these are some of the, the thoughts that, that are some models that we're looking at for why the psychedelics seem to be having such a therapeutic effect. And then another thing that is fascinating is the sense that these psychedelics are psychoplastogens. And this may not be exclusive either. They, they may be tied in, but David Olson at UC Davis has been working on models that suggest that even compounds of this general class that aren't psychedelic per se, in animal models seem to drive the formation of new uh, spindles, new synapses in the brain, and allow the brain, in a sense, to uh, not necessarily heal itself, but to reconnect in a different fashion. And th there's a lot of enthusiasm about uh, strokes and Alzheimer's in the same sort of context. But he's trying to suggest that this might be some of a more general explanation for some of the changes that we see in the, the brain communication, such as in the slide we just looked at. So as you might imagine, uh, from these really encouraging reports, and then the illicit um, use of psychedelics, LSDs, mushrooms, and others for well-being, there's a really strong uh, interest in liberalizing the availability of these compounds, similar to what's happened with cannabis. And in fact, we've seen in the past few days that mayor of Minneapolis has decriminalized the possession of mushrooms as well. Um, there are those that are really strongly arguing for microdosing as well. This seems to be a, a topic that's really hot now. And, and frankly, there are a couple of studies that have looked at both LSD and psilocybin, looking at whether microdosing works or not. This is the most recent one. This was for psilocybin. And basically, they, they find that, yeah, there, there may be some enhanced subjective effects. There may be some uh, 
increased creativity and cognitive function. But when you compare that to the placebos that they used in these studies, the placebos also did that. Uh, they also increased creativity and cognitive function. So there was statistically no difference between the placebo and the psychedelic compound at a low dose, leading to the argument that a lot of these microdosing reports of uh, benefit are really expectation bias, just basically a placebo effect. So there's no real data at this point to argue in a uh, rigorous manner that microdosing is beneficial. So it would be great if we could look at um, psychedelic therapy in a more general sense, but we are limited in terms of uh, several aspects of the overall therapy model. And one of the biggest issues is the number of therapists that uh, we have available to us. The qualifications of therapists are evolving, but the FDA is requiring particular credentials that I'll show you in a second that um, limit the availability of trained in, uh, medical professionals to provide <clears throat> psychedelic assisted therapy. There's also a perception, perception and stigma problem. For many individuals, many cultures, research in general is uh, something to be avoided because of abuses that have taken place in the past with the Native Americans, with Blacks. Uh, there's also the stigma of taking a drug that is otherwise illegal. It's legal to do it if you're doing it in an approved study, but taking psilocybin or LSD outside of the clinical study is still illegal. And there's also the sense that in the substance use disorder studies, such as with cocaine or our studies with uh, methamphetamine or opioid uh, use disorder, some argue that we're replacing one illegal drug with another, which is not the case. We're, we're giving one or two doses um, a month apart, and that's it. We're not uh, replacing anything. So access is going to be a problem. Therapists, as I've already mentioned, treatment venues. If you've got an eight-hour day of attendance with dosing and then sitting with this individual for a full day, you have locked up that treatment venue for the entire day. And that really limits how many people you can put through a system. And the other thing is that there are a lot of visits required. And how is that going to affect individuals that have to travel to the treatment site or have to take a day off of work, which may be very difficult for individuals with limited income. And then those that are uh, trying to find childcare for uh, those who are single parents. Here are some of the expectations that the FDA has of therapists. The lead monitor of two has to have a um, MD or DO, master of social work, professional counselor and so on. So these people are, uh, are out there, but arguably, should they be sitting in a room with one person uh, for eight hours, day after day, or should they be out uh, counseling them on a, a half an hour or an hour basis? If we had enough individuals, that would be great to be able to take the, this level of expertise. But I think that one of the reasons that the FDA is looking for people like this is in part, not just for their qualifications, but also because they're certified by the state and that that certification could be put at risk if something wrong, something bad happened. There's a lot of debate about whether other individuals might be uh, appropriate for this, such as chaplains. I think chaplains would be a great group. The other thing that I mentioned was a number of visits. This is an example of the, um, the schedule, if you will, for the study that recently closed using MDMA or ecstasy for the uh, as an adjunct for the treatment of PTSD. And it's a nice graphic that I pulled. It's not a psychedelic per se, but it does give you a sense of some of the similar expectations where we have a screening component over on the left and then a tapering period while they come up various medications. They have preparatory sessions given in orange. You see three of those, typically about six hours. And then uh, the red bar here at number one is one of the three experimental sessions. And then you can see that there are three integration sessions, debriefing sessions, if you will, reinforcement sessions after each of these doses. Now, if there are two sessions, then granted you decrease the number of visits, but you can see that there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of time involved that this is not just come on in, we'll give you a dose of psilocybin. We'll see if it works at the end of the day. There's a lot of screening. There's a lot of preparation and there's a lot of debriefing in front of and in back of each of these doses. How safe are these psychedelics? <laughs> um, 
we have evidence that the um, psychedelics are generally quite safe. Most commonly, we'll see uh, elevated heart rate and blood pressure during the session that resolves with, without uh, any therapy. Sometimes people have nausea and vomiting, see more of a problem with ayahuasca than with psilocybin. And many people have a headache about 12 hours afterwards that is resolved with some acetaminophen. Rare is a hallucinogen uh, persi persisting perception disorder or psychosis that usually, if it does occur, it resolves fairly quickly. Um, no evidence of addictive effects in animals, so some people are concerned that they would become addicted to LSD or psilocybin. That does not seem to be the case. Uh, more of a risk with MDMA and that, that's involved in the treatment of PTSD. One of the concerns that came out of that COMPASS was a study, we showed you comparing 1, 10, and 25 milligram doses for depression, treatment-resistant depression, is some increased suicidal behavior. And so that's some, something else that we're going to be having to watch very closely closely in the larger phase three studies that they're going into. We try to minimize the risk of some of these um, bad outcomes by screening individuals and excluding those with schizophrenia or other psychosis, uh, various bipolar disorders, individuals who cannot come off of their SSRIs or SNRI does antidepressants. If they are going to be in, on a study and they are taking these drugs, they have to be tapered off over the period of several weeks. And some people just can't tolerate that where their caregivers are unwilling to, uh, their prescribers are unwilling to authorize that. And of course, we're also excluding this individual, this time individuals that are pregnant. Although there is interest in looking at postpartum depression with uh, psychedelics. Most of the injuries, the deaths associated with psychedelics have been from injuries where people wander off or they're doing, taking these drugs in a naturalist setting, um, that uh, allows them to wander into traffic or fall. Uh, there are increasing numbers of emergency department visits, largely uh, anxiety, panic, paranoia. And in individuals with a history of various mental illnesses, this uh, percentage is, is higher, but not a terribly high incidence. And typically these symptoms resolve fairly quickly. One of the concerns that we've got is that there's this neuroplasticity, this uh, uh, the, the period in which the effects of the psychedelic may have some residual momentum, if you will. It's not really clear uh, how long that lasts for any individual or a particular psychedelic, but it raises the concern about what kind of home or work environment we put the person back into after a dose and what kind of reinforcement, uh, negative or positive, might occur there. Now, there's some evidence that, uh, that people who have taken psilocybin or other drugs uh, may have an increased uh, nature relatedness and decreased authoritarian uh, view, and that this is sort of the, the one that is promoted by the, the media. But actually, Brian Pace and Nase, uh, Nase Davido have written on how psychedelics have been, been embraced by the, the right wing and authoritarian groups as well to reinforce their uh, behavior. And so I think that it's naive to say that everybody who's taking psychedelics is going to look at, uh, towards world peace and, um, and have a sense that this is uh, a liberal, exclusively a liberal uh, sort of drug. It is not necessarily, and I think we need to be careful about that. I've already alluded to some of the issues that are pressing us in terms of psychedelic therapy. Uh, how should these therapists be trained or credentialed? What kind of training is there going to be required uh, for different kinds of diseases? And then um, whether we can make this more efficient as well. We've got two, two, two therapists watching, helping one individual at a time at present. Can we be more efficient? How do you control these drugs? How do you not, sorry, how do you have a control arm for these drugs? When you have a psychedelic experience, people really know that they're having a psychedelic experience for the most part. There have been other drugs that have been used, such as the diphenhydramine I mentioned, the methylphenidate, the Ritalin, um, niacin to give a flush, but none of these are really good placebos, and the FDA recognizes that. And then um, we're also concerned about what kind of stipulations the FDA is going to place upon the environment for dosing of these individuals. Can we be more efficient? I've already alluded to that. Could we do dosing at home? Can we use uh, drugs with a shorter half-life or effect time, such as 5-MeO-DMT, to decrease the time that they're in the chair or in the room? And when you think about the ayahuasca ceremonies, such as in Peru or Ecuador, they're typically group uh, sessions with uh, various leaders 
Um, and we can argue that that may not be the best way, but maybe uh, some fraction of this number might be a group that we could we could work with. So how do we maximize the safety? How do we try to um, maximize the effect? Again, I've, I've alluded to this telephone screening and the, the psychiatric assessments that we do to exclude individuals that are at risk. The pre-dose preparation the, uh, in, environment that we call the set is typically going to be uh, rather uh, secluded with eye shades, music through headphones to try to have individuals uh, uh, so internalize their experience. And then I've already mentioned the two trained facilitators and guides to protect the space and the debriefing that comes afterwards. We talk about a set, then this preparation, and then the setting is the dosing environment. And then again, increasingly we're recognizing that support that, that comes after the dose is going to be increasingly important and we don't really know how best yet to do that. Um, that is going to be something that we need to look at. This is our setting, our dosing room at the School of Pharmacy. And you'll notice that I uh, the, the two chairs for the therapists here, the, the sofa that the individuals can lie down on, we decrease the lights uh, so it's much uh, less bright than this. Uh, you'll also note that I have uh, the setting spelled with capital S-E-T-T. -T, and the reason for that is that uh, we feel that UW Badgers are the best place to be doing psychedelic research because uh, a set, S-E-T-T, -T, is also the formal name for a badger den which is why the set pub is named the set at Union South. It's a badger den, so we should be here. We also have uh, developed our transdisciplinary center. I, uh, I'm proud to be the founding director, but I'm really supported by a cohort of individuals across the campus. And I think this is one of the things that really makes our center rather unique. Um, we also are unique in having the first Master of Science in Psychoactive Pharmaceutical Investigation, led by Dr. Cody Wenther here at the School of Pharmacy, uh, a uh, 32 credit curriculum, again, first in the country, completely online, although we have some individuals that have moved to Madison to be able to uh, be closer to where it's happening. We have uh, multiple studies that we've completed here at the UW Madison. Uh, one of the ones that I think is the most impactful to date was the, the one that we started with, which looked at the safety of escalating doses of psilocybin, as well as establishing um, a fairly uh, standard dose of 25 milligrams now of psilocybin. And again, this is synthesized psilocybin, psilocybin not uh, mushrooms. So you know exactly what the individuals are getting in the purity of it. We've also done studies of MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD using for MAPS. That um, drug is going to the FDA probably later this year, early next, for the uh, as an edging for the treatment of PTSD. We also have other studies that are currently underway. The Protea group under the leadership of Randy Brown in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health and his colleague, Dr. Christopher Nicholas, looking at the Howdy study, which is looking at psilocybin in individuals with opioid use disorder, and also a similar study in, uh, of psilocybin in, in persons, oh, the typo here, I'm sorry. Um, the Primus study is looking at psilocybin for the treatment of individuals with methamphetamine use disorder, not opioid. So we're looking at opioids, we're looking at methamphetamine. We also have another interesting study called RECAP. I alluded to that earlier. And we've got uh, professors Banks, Dunn, Cody Winther, Charles Razan, Chuck Razan, Richard Leonards, and again, uh, Chris Nicholas. Here we're using the drug midazolam administered by Dr. Leonards to individuals who have taken psilocybin to see if if we can block their memory of their psychedelic experience. What is the importance of remembering your psychedelic experience? What kind of things uh, are accentuated or blunted if you can't remember um, the effects of your psychedelic experience? And if um, we're, we've completed one small study, we're looking at expanding that. We feel that this is gonna be a very fundamental study to uh, answer questions about the mechanism of the uh, psychedelics in general. Another study that we're excited about, we hope to start soon, is looking at the injection of intravenous psilocybin to persons who are, are asleep. And here with uh, Dr. Uh, Rosan, uh, Dr. Garlow, Stat Jones, and Nicholas, we're going to be taking individuals of the, uh, that are asleep under EEG, bolus them with uh, some psilocybin and see what happens to their EEG, uh, and then compare that with awake subjects. 
to see what the effect is on consciousness as it is experienced both asleep and uh, alert. And then another one coming up, a fairly large study, in normal volunteers will be oral psilocybin to increase the, the cognitive effects of vagal nerve stimulation. We're um, moving forward with the, the regulatory components of that study. Also wanted to mention that uh, Cody Wenther is also looking at cultural impacts, cultural effects that maximize or perhaps diminish the effectiveness, the meaning, meaningfulness of the psychedelic um, experience, looking at various demographic groups. Luke Rickert here at the School of Pharmacy is um, very active in coordinating some Bardese Mellon workshops, looking at psychedelics, and also digitalizing some of our holdings in the American Institute uh, for the History of Pharmacy, our, a really great collection of materials here, with a focus on um, drugs of abuse and illicit drugs and psychedelics in general. So uh, a huge resource for not only our group, but the community as a whole. Uh, Cody also has a fantastic uh, in, uh, laboratory program looking at some of the things that affect the impact um, of psychedelics, such as stress and cortisol levels. Matthew Banks looking at the mechanisms of neuroplasticity associated with psychedelics, and also looking at the, uh, the uh, anti-inflammatory effects of psychedelics as well that seems to have an effect on the, the inflammation in the brain. Alberto Vargas in the Caribbean, the Latin American Caribbean and Iberian Studies Department, looking at um, the effects of uh, psychedelic tourism, indigenous issues, and uh, threats to basically the traditional uses of these, uh, and also developing some really interesting graduate uh, research programs in Latin America and, and the uh, southern states of the United States. And Megan Miller from the School of Nursing, looking at spirituality and the impact of psilocybin therapy on spirituality and some barriers that people might have, especially at end of life. So she's looking at various, hopes to be looking at individuals from various uh, ethnic groups as well. John Dunn, also participating in the recap study, has a particular interest in the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience. People say that it's ineffable. You can't really describe it, but he, can, he would argue that we're just not asking the right questions. And so we're trying to figure out what those questions should be. So one of the things that we're grappling with, uh, I've alluded to already, is how can we make this more efficient? How can we um, push this treatment when it is approved outside of Madison, outside of Milwaukee? How can we make it more available? And what kind of roles will we have uh, here at Wisconsin after the FDA approves it? So we're looking at uh, some other issues that we're uh, potentially able to contribute to, drawing upon not only our clinical side of research, but also the other schools on campus, other colleges on campus. We have a research and education fund through the UW Foundation that goes to support many different aspects. We also have um, a, a website for the Transdisciplinary Research Center for Research and Psychoactive Substances. Individuals who might have an interest in uh, accessing or participating in psychedelic studies can go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is run by the US government. Look at Randy Brown's uh, research group at Protea Research or uh, they can contact us at our research um, website. I wanna point out that we have a symposium coming up in early November, our third annual, and information on that will be forthcoming. We're expanding uh, the number of seats, so we're gonna be holding it down in Fitchburg at the Promega Biotechnology Center, as opposed to the, to the DeLuca Center. And I encourage individuals to sign up for that, and it should be a great program. And I'll stop there. I hope I've left a little bit of time for some questions. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. It does look like we have a few questions here. So um, let me get started. Um, so with ketamine currently available and um, psilocybin not anticipated to be available for several years, what would your recommendation be for pursuing one over the other for treatment of MDD or mild depression? Uh, it's FDA approved actually for uh, depression. We do not yet know whether psilocybin is better than ketamine, but we do know that the ketamine is available uh, at various locations, not as widely as we would hope. So, if someone is needing treatment that is not otherwise being uh, adequately uh, controlled for depression, then I think ketamine is worth 
investigating through your caregiver. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so one question is, since there are multiple types of mushrooms, is there a standard type that is used throughout these studies? And where, uh, having been from Colorado, when we started doing the cannabis studies before the rest of the country did, uh, it was very hard to get consistent grade um, cannabis at that point in time. And I imagine you might have some of the same issues. So how, how do you deal with that issue? Well, we avoid it completely by using completely pure synthetic psilocybin. So we have um, a clear understanding of what we're administering. There are those that argue that using uh, an extract of mushrooms is better because you get more of an entourage of other compounds in addition to the psilocybin that may be related or may enhance the effect. The other reason individuals are looking at extracts uh, or just powdered uh, for standardized formulations of mushrooms is that they are able to protect it. The, 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 those preparations are more uh, unique and therefore patentable. Great, thank you. Um, so we know that the FDA has issued recent guidance on the use of psychedelics in research. Do you have any thoughts around the FDA's recent guidance? Uh, I, I agree with much of it in terms of the purity expectations. Uh, I think one of the bigger concerns that we've got are the um, requirements for um, the therapists. I, I think that we should be including clergy and chaplains. I think that we also need to be careful about the expectation that the, uh, the debriefing takes place by is done by someone other than the therapists with whom the subjects have a therapeutic alliance because we feel that that debriefing, that integration um, and reinforcement is very, very important. And we probably don't even recognize yet how important that is. So there are some things where we agree. Um, I, I agree with most of those guidelines. And again, that's for clinical research. We're not sure that those same expectations will be required when the drug is approved by the FDA. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a question about whether or not patients in this study, um, in addition to um, being dosed with psilocybin, were they also getting uh, traditional cognitive or behavioral therapy? I'm not sure which study um, the questioner is referring to, but Typically, the, during the eight-hour session, there, there is not a lot of engagement between the therapists and the, the person being dosed. That's not the case with MDMA for assisted therapy for PTSD, where there's more formalized, protocolized uh, psycho, uh, psychotherapy. Uh, and so that raises the question, how much mental health training does one need to be attending someone who is being dosed with psilocybin? We don't yet know. Frankly, the FDA admits that in terms of their guidance is they don't, they don't really know how important that psychotherapy component is for op maximizing or optimizing psychedelic uh, therapy with psilocybin. Okay, great. Um, I think that answered that question. Uh, will UW also be considering studies utilizing ketamine um, given that it might have a shorter time duration? Dr. Garlow um, and, uh, and others are, uh, are looking at the study. Dr. Garlow has been using ketamine for depression for some time. Uh, with Dr. Ryan Haringa and Stephanie Jones, we're looking at uh, some models of ketamine for PTSD and maybe extending that to MDMA-assisted therapy for some particular uh, uh, cohorts of individuals. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's another question. Any consideration um, for in-home visits, obviously mm -hmm. with trained staff, but maybe also trained family members to observe participants after a defined period of time? That's a great question. Uh, we've That would be avoiding the question of trying to find a venue. Uh, and we could just have individuals that are trained to come and attend and protect the space and reinforce uh, uh, the proper environment. There's some things that we can't control though. It may be that there's a lot of disruptions or interruptions in the household. There may be things going on there that uh, are not desirable. 
I think that we should explore that. I think it holds a lot of potential, but right now I, I can't say that this is uh, something that is going to be better than. It may be something we can ex expand to, but I think we should look into it. I, I, li I like the idea, quite honestly. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned a subset of bipolar patients experienced increased mania. Was this in bipolar one or bipolar two patients? And is there any future in studying psychedelics in bipolar two only? Actually is uh, research going on right now in bipolar two, in, uh, type two bipolar disorder to see if in fact this subgroup may be able to uh, tolerate and uh, take advantage of the psilocybin effects. Right. Um, is there any research planned on use for pain management? Pain management studies are uh, underway, or at least were underway. The company that was sponsoring that had to pull back because of lack of funding. But again, in the concept of rewiring perception of pain and especially central sensitization of chronic pain syndromes, I think there's a great deal of promise there. We just don't have the money to look at it. I'd love to look at that. Right. Um, see, this one's a little long here. Um, do you see the lower number of doses needed in order to see effect as a boon or a barrier in the industrial implementation as a care option? Wondering if pharmaceutical companies would be, oops, would be uh, less likely to promote use since it doesn't require consistent like daily usage, um, which would lead them to potentially ballooning the price of psychedelic therapies. We have the same problem with uh, antibiotic development where if we're successful, the patients get uh, one to two weeks of therapy, if that, and then they're done, they're cured. And so where's the economic advantage in developing antibiotics? And the same thing can be said for one or two doses of, of psychedelics. I'm not sure how money is going to be made in this industry, quite honestly. It's going to be a big challenge, especially with the time and the cost of the individuals that you have to have preparing, debriefing, and attending those individuals during their session. That's the huge right. price. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. Can you talk a little bit about any side effects or adverse events that have been measured between standard treatment versus psilocybin? Uh, if you're dealing with uh, depression, then the, the side effects associated with the SSRIs and SNRIs are far greater, far more prevalent than with psilocybin. Great. So there are lots of other questions, but I think we're out of time. Um, so we might have to invite you back again to hear more about what your center is doing and the great work that you all are exploring. I wanna thank everybody for joining us today for this wonderful presentation from Dr. Hudson there. I don't know if you can see the comments, but there's lots of um, thank yous because I think this was a much needed and much appreciated um sessions.